morning, church. Today's scripture reading will be in Titus, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Paul, a bondservant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God, and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, and the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifested, his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. Good morning, church. It is great to be back with you. Um, I was starting to get used to the 95 degrees when I was preaching. And a week ago right now, I was preaching in 95 degree temperatures, and I think somebody turned the air conditioner down. My feet are very cold right now, so uh, I'm hoping my toes will work enough to keep me standing up right while I preach this morning. Uh, but it is great to be home. It is great to be back. Uh, it's great to be in my own bed. I was in, uh, I think, 10 beds the last three weeks, that none of them were my own. Um, so it's been a, a long trip. Uh, the trip began with uh, the death of a very dear loved one, and I had to leave a day earlier than I anticipated. Uh, my cousin's wife passed away unexpectedly at 60 years of age. She and Susie were pregnant at the same time and gave birth to both of our first sons five days apart. Uh, we have pictures with my grandmother of us sitting there with our two babies and, and all of this together, and uh, Sharon was an extremely sweet and giving person and is, um, is very missed. In return to my stepmother being in the hospital uh, with stroke-like symptoms, it turned out she was having a reaction to some medication she was taking, and she's in physical therapy now. So I, I left uh, with uh, the death of a, a loved one and came back and spent uh, about a day in the hospital with my father and, and his wife. And so I'm very glad to be home and very glad to be here with you uh, I hope that uh, if you are able, that you will take time this evening to return uh, at 5 o'clock. I'll be giving my report from the trip to Guyana. Uh, some very exciting things happening there, and would love to tell you about that. Many of you helped participate in that trip by uh, providing funds uh, to uh, uh, for my trip and for needs along the way while I was there. And for those, I'm eternally grateful, and thank you for that. But I'll look forward to, to speaking to you about that uh, this evening. Would you pray with me, please, as we begin? Our God and our Father in heaven, we thank you for the amazing love that you've shown us. We don't know how it could be such. We understand that we are but dust, but so do you. And you love us. And you continue to love us even when we fall short of your divine glory. We thank you for that love, Father. And we pray that as we look into your word that we could come to understand greater the depths of that love which you have for us. Father, bless us during our time of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To our scripture reading from a few moments ago. In Titus chapter 1, in the middle of this verse, the, the first verse is very typical of Paul's letters, as he introduces himself as the writer. He shows his credentials as a bondservant and also as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He makes this statement in verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began in hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised before time began now those of you who uh, struggle with the English language as a lot of us do uh, still understand that there are clauses within sentences to help expand our thoughts within sentences and the clause here, which God, who cannot lie, is the clause inside of this sentence. And I want you to, uh, to read with me this sentence without the clause. Eternal life promised before time began. Eternal life 
promised before time began. Now, we know that that promise is true because God cannot lie. And that's what Paul is explaining to us there. God can't lie, and so when he makes a promise, he will fulfill his promise. Our ability to accept the things of that promise are based upon our faithfulness to him. But God's promise is eternal. And he promised eternal life before time began. But when did time begin? Time began when he spoke the world into existence. When he spoke the world into existence, you didn't exist. Nor did our great-great-grandparents, Adam and Eve. And I struggle with this. The more I study it, the more I struggle with it. Let me tell you why. Because before time began, God promised eternal life. Why would he promise eternal life? He promised eternal life because he knew he had already purposed in his mind to create a being to love. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 Let us make man in our image, in in our own image. And he makes them male and female. We, We as human beings are different than all of the other animals because we are stamped on the inside with the image of God. That makes us different. It makes us extremely unique among all of the living things on the planet. And so God knew before he ever made time much less making human beings, that eternal life would be something we would need. How did he know that? Turn with me over to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold and from from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He was indeed foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. We were not redeemed by corruptible things. We were not redeemed by created things. We were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as if of a lamb without spot or blemish. For he was foreordained before the foundation of the world. I struggle with that. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, now Jesus was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation or before the foundation of the world. You see, God knows all things. And when God looks down across time, before he even creates time, he sees human beings. And he knows that human beings are going to need salvation. And God the Son, who is right there with God the Father, equal in form, but under the Father's authority, looks to his Father and he says, I will die for this uncreated group of people. Why would you do that? Why make us in the first place if you know it's going to cost you that much? I know me, and I know some of you, but not as well as you know you, and certainly not as well as God knows us all. And yet God looked down through history, and he saw you in your deepest depravity, and he saw me in my deepest depravity. And before he ever made Adam and Eve, before he ever laid the foundation for the world, Jesus says, I will go and die for them. 
We struggle to wonder about God's love. And let me tell you, how could a God create a being that would reject him, that would thumb our noses at him, sin against him, separate ourselves from him, but yet before ever making us, loved us enough to provide us a way back to him? That love existed in eternity past. The plan of God existed before the foundation of the world. It was not like God creates the earth and, he, and in six days everything's there and there's Adam and, and, and let's make Eve from his rib and we bring them together and all of a sudden the serpent and Eve and Adam have this little conversation and God goes, oh no. God knew exactly what was going to happen. And he made us anyway. Why? Why would a God do that? Why would he make a being that would intentionally break his heart? Would you? I struggle with that. I struggle with that kind of love from God. But Jesus... says I will die for them even before the foundation of the world was ever laid I will die this Jesus who in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 God who at various times and various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the worlds. Before time began, before the foundation of the world, who's the creator? God the Son's the creator. God the Father purposed it, and through Jesus he creates the world. Now, Consider with me for just a moment. Let's move ahead throughout history to a point in time about 2,000 years ago. And Jesus is on the earth. And he stands before Pontius Pilate, and Pilate has him scourged with a flagrum that was a stick and three pieces of leather sewn and stitched into the leather were pieces of bone, rock, and metal. Who made the animal that leather came from? Who made the tree that grew the stick? Who made the bones and the rock? Who made that instrument that shredded the back of Jesus Christ? He did. Who made the thorns that were woven into a crown that pierces? Who made the reed that struck him in the face? Who made the people that were punching him and spitting on him? Who grew the tree that was fashioned into a cross? Who put the iron in the soil that were fashioned into nails that drove into his hands and into his feet and held him to that cross. Who did that? Jesus did. Through whom he made the worlds. John chapter 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and nothing was made that was not made through him. All of the instruments and implements of his torture and his death he made and before he made them he knew what they would be used for and he made them anyway he made them anyway verse 14 and the word in order for those implements to be used upon him and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
he became flesh. He had to become flesh because he could not die in his previous form. You see, we, we struggle sometimes about the love of God, and we struggle when we see tragedy strike, like what happened at that school in Florida or any other tragedy that you can possibly imagine, earthquakes, floods, tornadoes, whatever, cancer, whatever things befall us, and we struggle to wonder if God really love us. And yet, when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely will one die for a righteous man, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. Who did he die for? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Speaking to the Christians in Ephesus, Paul writes, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. When we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You wanted to find the ungodly? Look at these three verses, because that's who we were. That's who we were. God, he looked down across time in eternity past, and he saw that condition, and he made us anyway. He made us anyway, so he could show us how much he loved us. We struggle. We struggle to even like people sometimes much less love them when they do things against us we struggle with that and god looks before he ever makes us and he says i love them and i'm going to do what's best for them and i'm going to provide for them in hopes that they will turn to me through my son jesus christ and be saved and come spend eternity with me he makes a promise of eternal life before time begins Jesus is that precious Lamb of God. Why? But God, who is rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, made us alive together with Christ. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, by grace you've been saved. And He's raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved. And it's not of yourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You see, there we were, those first three verses, describing this, us acting as the sons of disobedience, acting in, in our most sinful, deprived state. And what I've described before, I will describe to you again as the two most important words in all the Bible. But God. But God. Rich in mercy, abundant grace, raises us up, made us sit in the heavenly places because of his incredible grace. We're all familiar with John 3.16. For God so loved the world. A world that is not in existence yet. 
that he gave his only begotten son. You see, in the mind of God, before the foundation was ever laid, Jesus was already on that cross. He was already dead before we could ever even have an opportunity to sin because there was no earth and no, no life on earth. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And I struggle. Because before he ever makes the world, he knew that it would need to be saved at some point in time. And he makes us anyway. makes us anyway you know we have so many regrets in this life we regret things that we do as as children as parents as employees or employers as friends as spouses we regret things that we do and god didn't regret for a moment making us even though he knew what would happen because he wanted to show his love and demonstrate that to us and show us that despite, no matter how far you can fall, He still loves you. There is no depth to which you can fall where you are not loved by God. Because Jesus died for all. He died for all. As we draw things to a close, I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. You know why it's so sweet to trust in Jesus? Let this mind be in you, beginning in verse 5, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, what does that speak of? It speaks to his equality of form before the foundation of the world. Did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Robbery there means something to be held tightly to and not let go of. You know, so imagine, if you will, for just a moment with me, that you are out on the ocean and you're shipwrecked, and you're floating, and here comes a Coast Guard helicopter, and they throw down the line to you, how are you going to hold on to that line? You're going to hold on to it and not let go. That's the idea behind this word robbery. And Jesus didn't consider his previous form something to be held that tightly to. But what does Paul tell us? He didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He gave it all up for you. He gave it up for you because of a promise made in eternity past of eternal life Jesus gives it up he comes to this earth he lets go of his previous form he becomes a human being he comes in the flesh and he suffers the cruel suffering punishment torture of the entire event leading up to his death And if only one person was ever saved, you know what he would say? It was worth it. And I have a hard time understanding that. Because his ways are so much higher than our ways, our minds cannot comprehend fully what God has done for us. How he loved us so much knowing how we would be that he sends Jesus already crucified in his mind before he ever puts the dirt on the ground and forms us from that. And he loves you just the same today as he did in eternity past. And he desires for you to be in that heavenly home with him 
whenever that time is that Jesus returns. And he wants you to be there. He doesn't want you to be lost. He doesn't want you to be separated from him. And he wants to show you each and every day how much he loves you. As you're here today, maybe maybe you're a Christian. Maybe you've named the name of Christ, but perhaps you haven't really appreciated how much God loves you. You know, I was going down the road the other day, and as I was returning, I uh, rented a vehicle and went and visited my mom. And, and then when, when I left her place, I had to drive a couple hours to Nashville, Tennessee to go to uh, the airport. And there was a tractor-trailer truck going down the road and just scuzz all over the back of it. You know how it is when they're driving through rain and snow and all this. And somebody had written on the back of it, Jesus loves you. And I wonder if they fully grasp what that means. Because I don't. I'm trying to. Simple statement. Jesus loves you. But the depth of that statement goes so far our minds can't comprehend it. Sometimes we as Christians can't comprehend it. Maybe you're here today and you've been struggling with it. Maybe you don't understand it. And maybe you haven't been living your life in, in a way that honors that love that he shows you. Make correction today. Change your life. Change the direction. Whatever it is that you need to change, make a change today because tomorrow might be too late. If you're here today and you've never named the name of Christ, the precious Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, maybe you've heard some things today that you've never considered before. God loves you. He doesn't care what you've done. Jesus died to pay for those sins. And if you will come to him in obedient faith, he will wash those sins away and make you whole and make you clean and make you an heir to the promise of eternal life he promised before time began. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God? Do you believe that he came in the flesh, that he died for you, was buried and rose on the third day? Are you willing to confess the fact that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Turn from the, your former life, repent of the sins in your life, and be conformed to the image of his death, burial, and resurrection, being immersed in water that is baptized for the remission of your sins, being raised to walk in a new life, a forgiven life, a life clothed in Christ, and a life where now you have laid hold of a promise made before the foundation of the world. Can we help you this morning? Our brother has chosen a song in Christ alone. As we sing this song, if you have any need whatsoever, won't you make it known to us by coming forward as together we stand and sing.